This is a modified version of the talk I gave at the American Society of Head and Neck Radiology meeting in Orlando. It talks about the most recent advances in PET imaging. The previous videos in this series talk about how PET works, what the optimal technique is, hint, use iodinated contrast, when is it most useful in staging, monitoring, and surveillance of head and neck cancer, and how to avoid overutilization, when is it not worthwhile. I've also talked about interpretation specifically and consistently about NIRADS, which I'm a big fan of, and pet falls, that's a joke, how to avoid uh, pitfalls in imaging of the of PET uh, CT in the head and neck. This PET CT talk talks about what's new in 2023. New scanners that are available, new nucleotides that are available, new radio tracers, and some new scanner combos. The biggest advance in PET CT imaging is ultra long field of view PET CT. This, in my opinion, is the biggest advance in PET imaging since the invention of PET-CT itself. So how do you do ultra-long field of view PET-CT? Well, first, you increase the length of the bore of the scanner from 25 centimeters to 106 centimeters. And then, that's it. That's all you do. All we're doing here is increasing the length of the bore. How does that becomes such an incredible advance in this technology. Well, it allows us to use a single bed position for the entire body instead of the usual 8 to 11 bed positions that we need to acquire a PET CT. It means you can spend four times as long at that bed position and still do your entire acquisition in a fraction of the total time that used to be needed. Instead of 25 minutes to do the PET portion of the PET CT, we can acquire the whole body in five minutes. It means you can use less of your radiopharmaceutical. We're now using five millicuries instead of 15 millicuries for our head and neck patients. And with all of that, we are still getting a 10, factor of 10 improvement in the resolution of the images. This is a combination of spatial resolution and contrast resolution, and it is incredible. So let me show this visually. In a traditional PET CT, you've got a 25 centimeter bore in some part of the patient's anatomy. When there is an annihilation event, you'll capture that annihilation event if it happens to be pointed towards the scanner, essentially just front and back to the patient. If your annihilation event is angled in any other direction than this little angle here, you're going to miss it. So we miss the majority of the annihilations in a standard PET CT. But if you have an ultra long field of view PET CT, now you're capturing all of these oddly angled annihilation events. This is how we are able to get such better resolution in a shorter period of time with a fraction of the radiation dose because we're spending more time at this one with this one position, and we're capturing a much larger fraction of the actual events that we're trying to, to find. So how does it look? This is a traditional PET image using a traditional scanner, and this is the same patient the same day imaged on one of these ultra high field of view scanners. The New image is so crisp and so clear that you have to get used to a whole new range of artifacts. Normal lymph nodes in the head and neck that would have been invisible or blended into the background now show up and you've got to get used to that. You have to set new thresholds for what is normal and what is abnormal. These are normal lymph nodes in the groin, despite the fact that they're showing up beautifully. You need new thresholds for abnormality when you're on one of these ultra high field of view scanners. Here's another example in the head and neck. You can see every single muscle outlined throughout the head and neck. You could do a seminar on head and neck muscular anatomy just based on this PET CT. Each of the extraocular muscles outlined beautifully. The resolution is incredible. As I said, I, in my opinion, this is the biggest advance in PET imaging since PET CT. Let's talk about the different isotopes that we use for PET. You can use 
any of these six isotopes, but the problem with most of them is that they have a very short half-life, and so they're really not practical for modern imaging. And that's why we tend to focus on gallium and fluorine as our radioisotypes, because they have a half-life that is more practical for us. There are a large variety of tracers that have been approved by the FDA here in the United States. Several of these are for imaging of Alzheimer's disease. Several of them are for imaging of prostate cancer. There are tracers designed for cardiac imaging and for imaging of bone. There are, images, there are tracers for Parkinson's disease, for breast cancer. And way down here at the bottom, here are the ones that are of greatest interest to us in the head and neck. By far the most commonly used tracer, of course, is 18F fluorodeoxyglucose. We've covered this in detail in multiple other lectures, and I'm not going to go into it again. Gallium is most frequently used in dota octreotate, also called dotatate, or netspot is a brand name. This is an agent used for somatostatin positive neuroendocrine tumors. The most familiar ones are paragangliomas, medullary thyroid cancer, esthesia neuroblastoma, Merkel cell carcinoma, and carcinoid tumors. So let me show you an example. Here's a 42-year-old male with a glomus jugulari tumor, and he's got this lesion in his spine. Uh, in looking at this on the CT, it wasn't clear whether this was a metastasis uh, or whether this was a hemangioma of bone. There's some thickened trabeculae here. Uh, so is this vascular malformation or is this tumor? When we looked at this on a dotatate scan, there's a lot of uptake there, but I still wasn't convinced because uh, maybe it's blood pool or something like that. I, I couldn't convince myself entirely. So one of my colleagues who's better at spine procedures than I am put a needle in this and confirmed that this was in fact metastatic paraganglioma. Here's another example. This is a 36-year-old woman with an esthesio neuroblastoma. When we did a FDG PET scan, we were unable to find any metastatic disease. But when we did the gallium dota scan, we could find that there were additional foci of disease. Let me show you that in another way. These lymph nodes are abnormal. This retropharyngeal node and this level 2 node, definitely bright on the dotatate scan. And you know what? When I went back to the PET CT, that retropharyngeal node was there, but it wasn't hot, and I overlooked it on the CT component. So, in retrospect, it was there, but it sure makes it easier to see it on the dotatate scan. So, you're thinking to yourself, why do I need dotatate? I've used MIVG for years for my stomatostatin tumors. What's the big deal? Well, here's an example where a patient was scanned with MIBG and um, you, you don't see anything up at the site of the primary tumor in the skull base. And here's that same patient imaged with dotatate and the tumor is really obvious. This is a recurrence that just wasn't seen on MIBG. Dotatate does a better job. It's more sensitive for disease. PET-MR scanners. PET-MR scanners are superior to PET-CT only in certain situations. For example, lesions of the anterior skull base, lesions of the oral cavity, lesions of the larynx, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. Now, if you're saying to yourself, wait a minute, those are all the same lesions that I like to image with MRI, right. PET-MR is useful when you would have otherwise done a PET-CT and an MR to look at the primary lesion of the PET-CT to look at the rest of the body. So that's where it really is advantageous over PET-CT. I thought this modality was really going to catch on, but it hasn't gotten the traction that I expected. There are very few units in, in practice, even in the United States. Um, people are just happy enough doing their PET-CTs from distant disease and their MRIs for the primary site. 
there are still some situations where PET MR is really useful. Uh, this is a patient who had been treated for metastatic disease, and the question here is whether this is recurrent disease or whether it is radiation response. Um, this, this question is the bane of my neuroradiology practice, deciding whether it's radiation or tumor recurrence. Uh, and PET-CT is really, really useful. PET-MR makes it so much easier. Here's the fused image. You can see here that, in fact, this portion is recurrent tumor, whereas the vast majority of this lesion is radiation. I don't think there's any way you could have picked out which parts were tumor and which parts were radiation uh, without the PET portion of the examination. Uh, you know, you can try to accomplish this with SPECT, MR SPECT. You can try to accomplish it with perfusion. Those are good techniques, um, but PET MR can be really useful. Here's another example where PET-MR is really useful. This is a 39-year-old woman with breast cancer and a cranial nerve 6 palsy. I can look at this CT all day, and I don't see anything going on in the clivus. Why am I looking at the clivus? Because cranial nerve 6 it runs up to Rellis Canal in the back of the clivus. That's right where I'm most concerned about a cranial nerve 6 pathology is in the clivus. But this CT, I just can't find it. Here's an MRI, and there's some heterogeneity in the clivus, um, but it's not, not a slam dunk. Here's the PET MR, and you can see that the area of FDG uptake corresponds to this area with slightly different enhancement in the anterior clivus. This is a this is a breast cancer metastasis, and it it did uh, it did infiltrate back and and snag the left cranial nerve six into Rellos canal. Let's go back to that list of FDA approved PET tracers because I want to draw your attention to a couple of specific ones. Last year, everyone was getting really excited about Axiomen. This is a radio tracer designed for prostate cancer, but there were a couple of case reports that suggested that it might be even better than FDG for head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. It hasn't really panned out, and I think people have abandoned their excitement over that possibility. But not to worry, there are some new agents that people are excited about crossing over from other areas of the body into head and neck cancer. So let's get excited about those. The hot new radio ligands are PSMA uh, ligands. This is prostate-specific membrane antigen. Uh, th they have already been extensively studied in prostate cancer. They're already FDA approved. Um, but it turns out that PSMA receptors can be found in a bunch of different cancers, not just in prostate cancer. In particular, the receptors can be found in adenoid cystic carcinoma. Now, Adenoid cystic carcinoma is a problem because it has inconsistent FDG uptake. If it is a poorly differentiated tumor, yes, it will take up FDG. But if it is a well-differentiated tumor, it may not. Distant disease is the biggest threat of adenoid cystic carcinoma. We can often get local regional control, but distance disease is an inevitability with this disease. Even if it takes it decades to recur, that's what we're always on the lookout for in adenoid cystic carcinoma. So we'd really like our PET scan to be able to pick that up early, but FDG is not trustworthy. It may be that PSMA is more trustworthy than FDG for adenoid cystic carcinoma. It may also be useful in other salivary carcinomas. So we're gonna keep our eyes on this. It's promising. It's not really proven. I don't think it's ready for prime time, um, but imagine the Theranostics possibilities here. If you can label PSMA with radiation that can potentially treat treat a tumor, treat adenoid cystic carcinoma, treat the cannonball metastases that inevitably return an adenoid cystic carcinoma by targeting with this radio ligand tremendous possibilities for the treatment of this almost uniformly fatal disease. Another agent that's on the horizon is gallium-labeled FAPI, fibroblast activation protein inhibitors. These may be, may be, early reports, superior to FDG for many of our head and neck tumors. It is useful, particularly in FDG-negative salivary tumors. The same problem with adenoid cystic carcinoma and other FDG-negative salivary tumors. Can't pick it up 
on standard PET. Similarly, ther potential theranostic applications, treatment of these tumors, if we can um, turn these agents into therapeutic agents as well as diagnostic agents. Uh, these are awaiting FDA approval, so they are probably years away from the prime time, but we want to keep our eyes out. Another radioligand that's sort of distant on the horizon are EGFR inhibitors. Imagine that you could take cetuximab, a monoclonal antibody that we are familiar with for its use in treating squamous cell carcinoma. Imagine that you labeled that with a PET tracer so that you could see whether it would accumulate in the tumor. Then you'd know whether cetuximab was likely to successfully be able to treat that tumor. Then you could see using this whether any of that tumor was still left after the end of treatment and whether it was worthwhile to continue treatment with cetuximab. Incredibly powerful for an already incredibly powerful drug. This stuff is still in the research phase. We are years away from this possibility, but it's really intriguing. And if it works for cetuximab, substitute your favorite monoclonal antibody and try to do the same thing. Once again, the theranostic applications also really promising, really exciting, but years down the road. Those are the things that I think are most exciting in PET imaging in 2023. Uh, we'll talk about them again in 2033 and see how many of these predictions came true.